Okay, hi everyone, thank you for joining. We are continuing with the ACRC uh, uh, webinar series. And this time we're very happy to have Professor Marcus Gardil from the University of uh, Warsburg. Marcus, thank you very much. You can start. Okay. Yeah. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, to this presentation today. I'm very happy actually uh, yeah, to be invited to give this presentation in Israel. And I also see from the number of attendees that uh, the topic automotive radar and also then how we can apply automotive radar system architectures to like industrial use, for instance, um, yeah, gets a lot of attraction. So it's very nice. And hopefully in the next um, yeah, couple of minutes, I can uh, provide you, hopefully, with an interesting perspective I have basically on, on those um, development in the automotive radar market, because actually before joining university this year, I was working in the um, sector of uh, automotive radar for a couple of years. And then also give you some outlook and maybe some ideas I would like to see in the development of, of like radar front ends and so on, how we can use the automotive radar for non automotive um, applications, actually. And this is why I basically call this and what else we can do with them. Okay, now let's first look into the traditional, let's say, application we do have in the car today. Now, if we look into a modern car, then basically we do have four types of sensors, right, which can be used for monitoring the environment. We do have the cameras. Um, which are, especially if we talk about advanced driver assistance systems um, up to autonomous driving, are typically mounted behind your rear mirror. Then we might have radar systems, which are today typically distributed around your car. If I talk about today, then typically it's always, um, let's say, sensor configurations which go into or to the automotive customers today, which means you might see it on the streets in like two to three years, for instance, okay? So we do have the radars. Then, of course, LiDAR is also announced as a sensor technology. But a problem, of course, with LiDAR is it is a bit expensive. So um, it's not used too much um, today. Audi, of course, with uh, the Audi A8, for instance, has the uh, first couple of serious cars which really use LiDAR in a serious context. And we also do have the ultrasonic sensors. Okay. Now, if you compare um, those um, four types of sensors, then first of all, of course, we see they are all made to detect other traffic participants. I mean, that's the purpose, right? But if we now look at different features, then we see, okay, um, there is not the ultimate single sensor technology solution. Because let's check um, which of the sensors can do texture interpretation and we need texture interpretation for instance for those lane keep assistance right to detect the lane markings on the street then of course the camera is the only sensor technology which can do this we cannot do this with the radar not with the lidar systems and of course also not with ultrasonic sensors then for instance if you look at ambient light independence which is also closely related to all weather operation like if we have dense fog or snow then we see well the camera basically is um, a passive sensor technology so it has some problems at night then of course we need active illumination it has problems in dense like a uh, fog or snowfall but also needs some time to adapt if you drive from a dark scene into a bright one while like if you leave a dark parking garage and drive into the bright sun, then the camera kind of needs to adapt to those changed lighting conditions. Of course, this is not a problem with uh, radar, okay? Ambient light is not a problem for the LiDAR, but the weather, as we will see later, is a problem. And for the ultrasonic sensors, okay, both are also not, not a problem. Um, and basically, we could, of course, continue this list of features to like 20 or 30. But I think the essence of this slide basically is this one. In my opinion, there won't be uh, one single only sensor technology which can fulfill all needs for future driver assistance systems or, um, e or even if we go towards highly autonomous driving. We will um, always need, a, I would say, at least two of those. And the typical team today is a combination of the camera and the radar. This is what you also have 
in cars on the streets today, because with this combination, for instance, you can solve some challenges which are or would be quite demanding if you would use a radar sensor alone, for example, breaking on the end of a traffic jam. This is not so easy with the radar alone, but if you do sensor data fusion with the camera, then the problem gets manageable quite easy. Yeah, in the future, of course, we might extend this configuration to also including LiDAR systems because the LiDAR systems, of course, are the master here of this 3D mapping, like getting really dense 3D point clouds. This is very unique to LiDAR. But of course, the question is, will the cost of the LiDARs, will it go down um, and be attractive um, to future cars for a serious use? And then in my opinion, I grade out those ultra sensor sensors a bit because with a modern radar, you can do everything what you can do basically with the ultrasonic sensors. So I think in future, if you have a future radar configuration, as we also see in a couple of slides, then there won't be any need for the ultrasonic sensors anymore. But now today we want to talk about radars. Um, so in a nutshell, of course, most of you know this, if you have a radar sensor, then we emit a LED an electromagnetic waveform, it propagates through space, hits um, some objects, um, is scattered by the scattering centers. So we receive a couple of echoes and then basically we do a channel estimate. So we estimate of all paths um, from the radar to a scattering center, basically the propagation delay, but also the behavior along slow time. So like the Doppler um, characteristics of those paths. And then what is unique to radar is basically um, compared to communications is that we do have to estimate the physical geometry from this channel estimate. Now it might look simple in such a scenario where you do have isolated points scatterers or like in, in a free space environment, but think of having reflecting surfaces here. Okay, let's assume we do have one reflecting surface, then basically we would see in this scenario, for instance, like six targets, right, in the channel estimate. But from a physical point of view, we just have three targets and this reflecting surface. And this is a very challenging task basically to, for instance, detect where do we have reflecting surfaces, where we do we have true targets and where do we see due to those reflecting surfaces mirror targets. Because in a lot of driving scenarios, like on German highways, we always do have those metallic road boundaries, which act uh, as reflectors for a certain type. We always have these reflecting surfaces on the streets. Now the question is in which frequency bands do we do this? Well, there is the traditional frequency band around 24 gigahertz, which offers 200 megahertz of bandwidth, which was used for automotive radar and still is of interest um, for let's say um, serious applications. Okay, so there still is a larger large market volume for this one. And there also was an ultra wide band offered uh, five gigahertz of bandwidth, but it is going out of service. So not of interest anymore. So this is the traditional band. Remember, still of interest for volume applications, but of course, all modern developments focus those 77 and 79 gigahertz bands. And this is also what we are going to talk about today. Then, of course, you can never ever have enough bandwidth, right? Um, so there is also those uh, 60 gigahertz ISM band. And this one was opened by the FCC also for automotive use a couple of um, years ago. So this might find application maybe also for some kinds of interior monitoring of the car or something like this. And of course, there is activity towards 120 gigahertz and above. But the question here is, of course, it's, it's a different scenario, higher frequency, shorter ranges. So really how to apply this um, efficiently for automotive use. Now, what are the particular strengths of radar for automotive use in a bit more detail? So why is radar attractive for the cars? Um, well, radar basically is the only sensor technology which gives you a four-dimensional image if you take one measurement, right? So typically we take for the automotive use, you take one measurement every 50 milliseconds. Um, typically taking a measurement um, it, it takes much um, less time. So typically taking a measurement takes like 10 milliseconds and then we have to process the data and after 50 milliseconds, you typically output the data and then you do your next measurement, okay? And this 50 millisecond period is a requirement which comes from the common factor. And if we do a single measurement, then we get a four dimensional image with a radar, okay? Why? We get, of course, the range of all targets. We get the azimuth angle, we get the elevation angle, and what is unique to radar, at least today, is that we do get the radial velocity due to the Doppler effect, okay? Then radar also is the sensor technology which is most robust towards weather, as already indicated before. Now, if you look at 
the nominal range, 0 to 200 meters, towards the effective range, 0 to 200 meters in, for instance, snowfall. Actually, those plots I took from um, a workshop presentation from McCloskey uh, to, from 2017. And if you compare in purple the radar with um, in the laser, so the LIDAR in blue in the different, let's say, amounts of snowfall, then we see snowfall might have a big impairment on the LIDAR, but almost no impairment on the radar. And the same is true here um, for fog, mist, and haze, where really you can have big, big problems for the laser. So from a functional point, a safety point of view, radar is robust. So it, I think, is necessary for highly autonomous driving that you can always keep a safe state in your car. Then radar also is uh, the only sensor technology which basically can be integrated invisibly behind the bumper, right? Of course, you cannot integrate a camera behind the bumper, also not a LiDAR. This uh, can also not be done with the ultrasonic sensors because they also always have those like circular shape uh, impedance um, kind of matching layers there. So you can do this with radar and for a lot of, let's say, sensor positions, we uh, typically also do have to do this today that we do have to integrate the radar behind the bumper. But I always ask the questions, OK, so who was that guy? I'm not sure if it was an electromagnetics engineer who told basically the automotive customers that you can integrate a 77 gigahertz system behind a bumper, which then even might have a metallic paint, right? Because even if you do everything correctly, and with this, I mean, if you find kind of the right mounting position and the right mounting angle. So if this is the bumper and this is the radar, of course, they should never ever be parallel because then you get a lot of reflections. So if you, even if you find the right mounting position, then you easily still lose six to 10 dB behind the bumper, which means if your radar detection range is kind of limited to 100 meters behind the bumper, if you would take it out, then you could easily kind of achieve 150 meters or even more. So the integration effort is really large and I'm not sure if this is really worth it. And then of course, radar offers a very good compromise between range and field of view, where basically you can switch the beams and if you can focus the beams, then of course you get very long detection ranges. And you have, uh, if you use a very broad beam, then of course detection range is shorter, maybe 50 to 70 meters. Now, what are the typical radar configurations? So if you have a, a let's say, a middle or upper class car today, then typically you have three radars, okay? One is here in the front bumper, which offers this focus beam up to 250 meters of range maybe, um, which is used for your adaptive cruise control. And the radar, the same radar typically has a broad beam, which is used for instance, for emergency break in urban scenarios. And then you might have two radars mounted invisibly behind your bumper uh, in the rear corners. They are used with a focus beam, maybe up to 80 meters of range for the lane change assist and with a broad beam for the blind spot detection. And in the future, and I remember by this, I mean basically setups which maybe go to the customers right now. So we'll be in the streets in two to three years. Um, looks like follows. So the first major change is that you will have even in middle class cars, four radars in all four corners to basically provide a full 360 degree radar cocoon up to 50 or 70 meters, okay? So we will see basically everything what's going on around a car. The uh, rear facing focus beams um, typically are required to have a detection range up to 160 meters because this is, let's say, a thought of as the next upgrade to your adaptive cruise control. So today your car just decelerates if there is a slower truck in front of you. And in the future, of course, the idea is that you can autonomously take over this slower truck in the context of a highway pilot or something like this. And for this autonomous functions, you need some kind of more observation time. So we need this longer detection range. Yeah, and of course we will um, increase the performance of the front radars, but still there might be one high performance radar in the front bumper, at least for upper class, let's say, high performance adaptive cruise control. Um, for the middle class cars, which might have adaptive cruise control just to up to 130 kilometers per hour, you can typically omit this um, high performance ACC because you can do it with a data fusion from the two front corner radars, okay? And then we might see a lot of more radar in the car for comfort and safety functions. One is for instance, like for trunk opening, um, like a foot movement detection, 
the kick sensor that your trunk opens. Today, this is based on capacitive sensors, but they do have some challenges um, um, with like false detections. And then, of course, you can use radar for interior gesture control. And I think there will be a very large market for occupancy and child detection. Okay, so that you have a radar in the roof of your car and basically you can detect if there are human subjects or children on some certain spots in the car. One application for this child presence detection, we will see how this is made later, is uh, the new car assessment programs for the next coming of year, uh, the next couple of years. Because if you want to have, let's say, a five star security rating, then in the future you might need this child presence detection that your car can detect if, if children are left behind in the car, especially in the summer, that um, you reduce the number of fatalities due to hypothermia, okay? Good. So we will see a lot of radars in the car and therefore, um, yeah, radar also is an extremely high volume market. And automotive radar, I would say, is the biggest market for millimeter wave components for the next couple of years. Now, if we look at today's numbers, so those numbers might be a bit outdated, but uh, should be correct. So the market volume in terms of devices should be around 100 million devices today. You can see here in this light blue, the 24 gigahertz uh, has still a rather large market share, about 50%. Of course, the number of those 24 gigahertz systems will go down in the future. And of course, total number will increase and 77 and 81 gigahertz will get um, more and more important. And due to this, of course, the main design goal of automotive radars is provide a high performance system, but of course, provide the low price tag because it's a mass product, right? A mass product, mass uh, product millimeter wave. Um, so you have to fulfill a couple of requirements. So typically you have to build radars, which ideally do not need any system calibration because your customer, your car manufacturer just buys your radars plugs them in or clicks them in at the um, manufacturing line behind the bumper. And then basically it has to work out of the box. So you cannot do any precise RF calibration at the end of line of the car manufacturer. So you need a lot of, or put a lot of um, effort into auto calibration techniques, okay? So today's radars basically learn within the first couple of kilometers, uh, learn like correction tables, and they learn the alignment, they learn how to um, improve the direction of arrival estimation and so forth, because you do not have any precise calibration. Um, then, of course, it, we must be extremely robust and stable towards weather conditions. It must be uh, operatable in, in winter, summer, snow, mud, and ice must be taken into account. Typically, you do not have any system maintenance during a lifetime, okay? So you do not have any regular calibration intervals for your radars in the workshop. And therefore, um, at least for the high volume market context, I would say that also the automotive customers are not too much into those revolutions, which you, for instance, can read in the news or in research papers about novel radar techniques or um, novel approaches, but maturity of the systems and all those quality assurance um, processes that you are a manufacturer who, let's say, knows what, what's going on is very important. Um, and the enabler for this basically is that, of course, you do not build radars from scratch, but you use a platform approach. So the whole system design must be based on high level building blocks, okay, which are itself certificated for the radar application for the automotive market. And that's basically the only chance. And this is also very nice, this platform approach, because what we will see in the next couple of slides is that this will allow us to use also the radar, which was built for automotive use for other applications in a very cost optimized way. But now let's look at how we use it today for automotive use first. Now in the, um, or let's say if you if you do radar, of course you have a lot of um, possibilities which kind of waveform you use, okay? I mean, very intuitive is of course the pulse radar. So send out a short pulse, wait until it returns, basically count the time, or you have the propagation delay and you can calculate back to the range of the targets. And of course we do have a couple of different, let's say waveforms, which are especially useful for industrial use, but all um, today's radars, and I think also for the next, couple of years um, use frequency modulated continuous wave or a chirp sequence waveform. We will see a couple of um, operational details in the next slide. 
Of course, we do have impossible successes like orthogonal frequency division multiplexing of pseudo-random radars, um, but we will see how they perform because the problem with those two, even if you have typically efficient implementations, is that to get the same performance um, compared to FMCW, you need much more um, data to be processed. You have to put in a lot of more effort. So having this low price tag with those new waveforms is a bit more challenging. And of course, the question is, why do we need those new waveforms? Well, typically they offer much more flexibility. And this is also the only, I would say, uh, use why we should use new waveforms. We have more flexibility compared to the swept waveform FCW, and we need this flexibility, for instance, for MIMO systems, for increasing the robustness towards interference, or maybe for communications. Okay. Yeah, but today we use a check sequence FMCW. And now let's see how we build those radars. Um, so keep it as simple as possible to lower this price tag. Um, and what we need basically for an automotive radar is we need kind of five top level building blocks, right? So we need some antennas and RF passives, which kind of interact with the RF channel, for instance, like here. So we need some um, RF PCB where we have the antennas on board, uh, transmission lines for feeding the antennas and balanced unbalanced transformers, for instance. And then of course we do have RF connections to our radar front end, which typically is a fully integrated chipset or no, a fully integrated MMIC today. And then from this MMIC, we typically just do have digital interfaces like a high-speed data streaming interface to our signal processor, which typically is a microcontroller having some DSP cores today. Um, yeah, we also had FPGAs, but this is a couple of years ago. Um, and then from those DSP, typically you directly interface to your vehicle, either by the controller area network or by automotive ethernet today. And the remaining components is maybe the bus drivers, for those can or ethernet or a power supply and management. And then basically you realize this on a single PCB, single PCB because a PCB is a major cost factor typically in your bill of materials, especially since you need this RF laminate here. So take a simple PCB, uh, put it on some kind of aluminum housing, for instance, with some thermal vias interfacing to the housing to get a, the heat away from your DSP and your radar front end, apply some shielding, above the MMIC and also the feed lines to shield it from parasitic radiation or reception and then seal it in, of course, an RF optimized radome to make it waterproof. And of course, have the automotive rated uh, connector here, typically like two wires for your car interface, um, like the automotive ethernet and two wires for the power supply. Now, first thing is, um, of course, the antenna section. So how does this look like? And uh, with the antenna section, of course, we have to fulfill different requirements because typically in a modern radar, we want to have different beams. We need focused beams to get the, or to provide the long detection range to get the sufficient uh, gain of the antennas. And of course, we also want to have this broad view um, antennas for like this 360 degree radar cocoon. But in any case, of course, we want to focus the beam in elevation because typically we do not want to radiate into the sky and we want to reduce radiation towards the ground. We need some radiation towards the ground because we also want to detect what's coming back from the ground to, for instance, to detect the height of curbstones. But this is also for very um, short range applications also. Now to realize this, um, small elevation beam, of course, you need focusing in the elevation plane, which means we need always long antennas in the elevation plane. Typical approach was to use vertically polarized um, patch antennas, um, which were fed in series. And then you do typically the following. Um, modern radar has three transmit channels. And with the transmit channels, basically, you define your uh, different radiation patterns. So if you kind of use this antenna, transmit antenna, which is broad in the horizontal plane, and then you focus your beam in this plane. You can even tilt your beam um, in a static manner, because typically if you have this rear corner radar, then the mounting angle is 45 degrees. So you have to tilt your beam with respect to the BCB that you basically look straight behind your car. And if you use like single branch antenna on the transmit channel, then you have this broad beam. And regarding the receive side, so typically we do have four receive channels today. And to those channels, typically you connect the identical antenna elements with having all the broad azimuth field of view um, because they are multi-purpose both for the long range as well as for the short range. 
Now, um, traditionally it was vertically polarized patch antennas, but the problem with the vertical polarization is that you cannot uh, easily achieve this increasingly, um, a tremendously large field of view because of there or due to the zero so plot minus, minus 90 degrees. Uh, so the reason or the trend today is to use horizontally polarized patch antennas, which allow more easily, let's say, to achieve this broad field of view. But the challenge here is a bit more um, handling this coupling between the antenna branches and getting some smooth patterns. Now, regarding the front end, if we do FMC FMCW radar, we need a couple of building blocks, like a synthesizer generating the frequency ramps, then our uh, transmit channels, remember to be three today which are not only transmit channels, but I would say even should be better called like a uh, transmit modulators because we can do amplitude and phase modulation. Um, on top of that uh, signal here, which for instance, we need for MIMO operation, okay, to get orthogonality between the channels. And then we do have like, for instance, four receive channels, which receive the signals, down mix the signals and filter them. Then we digitize it and directly uh, stream it to our signal processor. Now, if you want to build a front end, then typically uh, the level, the integration level, which offers the highest flexibility is if you get a chipset. So you get a separate transmitter, separate receivers, uh, separate uh, synthesizers, so typical phase lock loop today, a separate microcontroller, including DSP. You connect this all together and you can easily scale up your radar system. But of course, this is not the cost optimized solution. And also um, like characterization and um, all the things is a bit more challenging here. So typically the uh, architecture of choice today is that you get a fully integrated transceiver from one of the um, MMIC manufacturers, which has three transmit channels and four receive channels on board and everything is in there. And then you just have to connect a signal processor and basically your radar, at least from a conceptual point of view is done. Now, if you want to scale up the systems, um, then those MMICs typically also offer like local oscillator outputs and inputs. And then you can, for instance, use two MMICs to build a six transmit channel, eight receive channel radar system. The next integration level would be the so-called single chip radar. So also take the signal processor and put it in the same package with your transceiver. You just have one package, of course, makes it a bit more cost efficient. Problem here is a bit thermal design because you take the two hottest components and put them in one package. And the final integration level is then all the antenna and package radar. So also take the antennas and put them in the package. Very attractive because it then uh, allows you to remove this high frequency laminate from your PCB and really push down the coast. But the drawback here is, of course, you are very limited with your antenna aperture and also with the layout of your antennas. Yeah, and finally, we connect this to a signal processor. And uh, here's just um, some wrap up of, uh, of the performance which we have today in the signal processes. And I think the most important message from, from this slide is that signal processing, processing power, and especially also the memory we have is a serious performance limiting factor today. Because you might think of, well, computational power is not a problem uh, today anymore. But in this context of, uh, let's say, high performance, but low price tech embedded uh, radar systems, the limit of the processing power is a problem. So even if we would keep the RF front end unchanged and we would like connect a more memory and high performance processes, we could easily increase detection range and angular resolution, for instance. Um, now, but the important trend we observe in the radars, um, which we have today, is that they are getting more and more towards a software defined system. So if you look at this combination, antennas somehow and then some analog front ends. So analog is used here in quotation marks because this analog front end, this MMIC we use in the radars today typically has 1000 or even more digital registers to basically control it, like to define the modulations we use and so forth. So it's really like more a hybrid front end. And the signal processor is a very um, flexible system because basically it's the software in the signal processor which configures the registers here which then kind of sets the modulation waveforms which we use and of course processes the data so we do have kind of a closed loop here and we can do a lot of uh, things by the software which is running here in the signal processor basically it's that software which really determines how this radar how we operate this radar 
And if you compare this to what we have in communications, where we also do have this fully integrated transceiver chipsets, and then for software defined radio, we just hook up those chipsets to our platform, could be an FPGA signal processor or PC based a processing device, which kind of takes those received signal processes it and uh, determines the transmit signals. Then I would say the radar and communications really grow together in this software defined sense. Of course, uh, performance parameters are a bit different. Typically in communications, we have this bandwidth uh, like 10 to 6 gigahertz for those fully integrated transceivers, where we do have a rather large IF bandwidth, high sampling rates. In radar, it's a bit differently. We do have this high carrier frequencies, but low IF frequencies, at least if we use uh, them for um, FMCW radar, but they are growing together. And I would see, uh, or would say that it would be very interesting uh, especially in the context of novel waveforms, if this growing together, if we will see more software-defined flexibility in the radars. Yeah, and the question is, will we see more flexibility in the future? So I observed uh, some things what's going on. So let me comment on this. Um, regarding the transmit channels, which we have on the radars, and I really now today prefer to call them transmit modulators, I would say, well, thumbs up, we see more flexibility here. Because a couple of front and generations ago, we just had maybe phase shifters, which offered like zero or 100 degree phase shift. And of course, a switch with, uh, which allowed to switch on and off the channel. But then we gradually saw that uh, basically the flexibility here increased because now we do have like finer granularity and the phase shifters. Also, we do have faster switches so we can kind of imprint more additional modulation on our sweat signals, which are generated by our synthesizer. And for instance, if we look at the things what are happening for some, yeah, like from Under or Oculi, which really uh, promote that um, tremendous use of uh, modulation flexibility here, or even go to a fully digital radar, where then we basically would have a full basement modulator here. I would say, okay, this is a very nice trend because we will see more flexibility on the transmit side of the radars. Um, then we also see that the basically one-to-one -one copies of those radar platforms now are also released for non-automotive uh, markets. Like a lot of um, um, front-end manufacturers kind of now um, have like um, front-ends using basically this automotive architecture, but for 60 gigahertz ISM frequencies on board. So I think we see more frequency bands, so we will get more and more solutions based on those radar architectures. Um, we see also more and more dedicated hardware processing in a lot of automotive signal processes, um, which basically implement necessary signal processing steps in hardware. Um, this is very good, I think, because of course we can see a higher throughput of data, so we can increase the performance, but we should consider this with care and also maybe the front end or uh, the signal processor manufacturers should consider this with care. Because if you put more and more IP, which simply is from the sensors, manufacturers into hardware, then basically we end up at a single, let's say, radar system architecture and also the signal processing basically is, is, is put there into hardware. And it could remove a bit of the flexibility we have in there. So I would um, more like to see um, general purpose coprocessors like embedded GPUs or something like this, which for instance can help in um, yeah, implementing neural network acceleration units directly into our automotive radar signal processes. And then, of course, we do have this antenna and package trend. Of course, it's very nice um, because we do not have to use the RF laminate, so we can uh, get completely get rid of basically this um, fact that we do have to get the high frequency signals out of the package onto the PCB. But of course, it eliminates so far any flexibility on the antenna design and it also reduces the aperture. So some approaches we are thinking of is that it would be much more efficient if you, for instance, implement a package to waveguide transition, and then using new manufacturing techniques, you basically um, yeah, print or produce injection mold and metallic kind of covered um, waveguide antennas, and you just put this structure over the MMIC. You can easily increase the aperture. You can define flexibly, define different antenna layouts um, without the need of an RF PCB. So this trend could, I think, also be very interesting. So this package to waveguide and your waveguide manufacturing techniques. Now, um, how do we use it basically? Now, 
this hardware we have for the automotive use case, we were already talking about this waveform we have, which is a frequency modulated continuous wave radar or respectively the chirp sequence radar, which we use today. Um, so for those of you who are not into those waveforms, let me repeat it uh, very shortly. So the fundamental principle of FMCW is shown here. So basically we transmit a continuous wave signal whose frequency linearly increases with time. So for instance, if this blue one is our chirp, which maybe has a chirp duration of one millisecond, then maybe we start at 76 gigahertz and it stops at 77 gigahertz, then we have one gigahertz of sweep bandwidth. So we transmit the signal and what happens, it propagates through space, hits the target, it is returned. So if we look at uh, basically the time domain, then we see, okay, we just receive and delayed an attenuated copy. And if you look at the instantaneous frequency over time, we see, well, we just receive a delayed version of this chirp. And now the fundamental frequency of FMCW is due to those linear chirp, we see that the frequency difference between blue transmitted and red received ramp is continuous and directly proportional to the propagation time. Proportionality constant is exactly the slope of our ramps or the strip rate. So the principle is, well, if we can measure this um, frequency difference, then we can calculate back to the propagation time and also back to the range. Now, how do we measure this frequency difference uh, between blue and red signal? Well, we just multiply those signals because then what remains at the output of the mixer is one component oscillating at some frequency, so 140 gigahertz or something like this, and one at exactly this difference frequency, which we call the IF frequency. So we remove the sum frequency, and then for this, for instance, one millisecond, we digitize that signal, that cosine here oscillating at uh, the difference frequency. We digitize it. We apply an FFT, we get a single peak at exactly the IF frequency. So detect the peak, calculate back uh, to the range and you know where your target is. Challenge here is if the target is also moving because then we do not only have this um, delay in time, but we also do have a, a vertical delay due to the Doppler effect, right? But you do have one challenge, you have one measurement, the IF frequency, but two unknowns, speed, so Doppler and uh, range. This was traditionally solved using slow, a so-called slow chirp radar. So where you use like a different linear independent measurements to solve this ambiguity, which means you use different RAM slopes and then kind of combine those measurement results to resolve those range um, Doppler ambiguities. Today, we do it a bit differently. So instead of using a slow chirp, which maybe has a one millisecond duration, we use at the same time a couple of as faster chirps, and this is why we call it faster, but chirp sequence. And then basically we collect this uh, received IF data of those chirps in a data matrix. So the received data of the first chirp goes into the first column, the received data of the second chirp into a second column and so forth. So this data matrix has size, um, number of chirp columns and number of samples per chirp rows. And then if you go through that signal model, ah, here it is. Um, how the phase basically behaves within this matrix, we see the following. Um, so if we walk along the fast time, so the rows of the matrix, we see that the frequency here is only dependent on the range. And if you walk along the columns of the matrix, the frequency is only dependent on the Doppler component. So we separated range and Doppler into two components. And now we do have to do a 2D frequency estimation, okay, to get this uh, simultaneously range Doppler of the target. So assume we do have a single target. Um, here, then the data matrix would look like this, okay? So we see uh, this cosine like signal whose phase is dependent on both the fast time due to the range and on the slow time due to the speed of the target. And then for instance, we do the first um, FFT along the fast time, which means we compress the energy in the corresponding range bin and the second FFT along the slow time and we get a single peak while we even pull let's say the energy out of this noise floor, we get a single peak if we have a single target exactly at the range and speed bin of the target. And if we have multiple uh, targets, then of course the data matrix looks like this. And after the 2D FFT here, we might get two peaks at the respective speed and range of the targets. And um, what is very important now, if you use FMCW radar, um, is that we now also do have two resolution domains. Now, what does resolution mean? In a radar context, resolution always means what is the minimum distance between two targets in a certain domain such that we see two peaks, okay? 
Very intuitive, of course, is the range resolution. And for FMCW radar, for instance, if we use like, um, yeah, a sweep bandwidth of uh, 3.2 gigahertz, then it's just 5.7 centimeters, which the targets have to be spaced apart so that we two, see two peaks. But we also do have resolution capability in terms of a Doppler, which means that even if the targets are at the same range, but one, for instance, is moving, then of course the peak shifts in, in this Doppler domain, which means we do have another um, domain for resolution. And the resolution and speed, this is all um, only dependent basically on your observation time, so how many chirps you use is also extremely fine, okay? This is very important to radar. And this is also very important to understand because if you are moving, so if you are driving and you have two targets at the same range, but maybe at different angles, then of course you observe different radial velocities. Here you see your ego velocity, here you see um, a reduced ego velocity and no Doppler, of course, if it's at 90 degree angle. And this is also how speed resolution, basically while you are driving can be utilized to get um, resolution and angle. And for FMCW, it's very obvious that you get basically the gigahertz range resolution, okay, because range resolution is only dependent on the RF bandwidth in terms of processing at maybe a megahertz data rate, okay, because we are just processing at this downmixed IF. And this is why FMCW is so attractive because you need only low speed A to D converters and of course only less memory and also you have to process. Remember processing power is a limiting factor. You have to process less data compared to like OFDM or pseudo random radars. Um, now if you want to also do use direction of arrival estimation and of course we want to uh, use this then we need, um, we need more um, information because we also need uh, let's say spatial sampling points to basically um, yeah, record the properties of the incoming wave field. So from which uh, direction does the wave field come from? Yeah, and this is typically done by just duplicating your received channels. Then you get one data matrix um, per received channel, right? Which means if we have like four received channels, then we get a cube because we do have the dimension slow time, fast time, and um, yeah, antenna channel dimension. And this is then also the fundamental processing, let's say, um, part which we have, which we keep in memory when using the automotive radar, the so famous radar data cube, which in range velocity domain, so after the 2D FFT has exactly those three dimensions, range, velocity, and the antenna or virtual antenna dimension. And um, now we were talking about, or we are talking about today, basically what else we can do with this radar system architectures. And I told you radar is moving towards kind of software defined radar. So we do have a lot of configuration possibilities in the front ends. So the front ends are very flexible. Now, the question is, why do we need this flexibility for automotive use? Because this is why the mass market, why the sensors are made for. The flexibility is necessary for, let's say, an optimum resource utilization of how we distribute the data points in our radar data cube to a certain sensing task. Because also with the car, we do have to do different things, right? We do have to do like long range for lane change assist or adaptive cruise control. We do have to do short range, for instance, for blind spot detection. We do have to do in a parking mode, very short range with ultra high spatial resolution for curbstone, height measurement and so forth. And we have to do all of this with the same hardware. And this is why we need this flexibility, okay? Um, now the typical constraints are that we collect one of those radar data cubes, or even if you have to uh, have to implement multiple functions, short range, long range, in a one um, measurement period, then we collect several of those uh, data cubes with different modulation settings in this 50 millisecond period. And then we process those frames and then basically we output this data. And of course, all those frames or radar data cubes, which we collect within the period have to fit in memory and we have to able to process them to kind of really provide this flexible measurement, um, measurement waveforms. And yeah, this is why we need also the flexibility in processing because processing power is limited, which means only process and collect what you really need. Um, then of course, um, yeah, we were talking here about um, MIMO radar data cube. Um, of course, we have, want to have an ultra high spatial resolution, which means we need a large aperture. And this is why basically we do have also the MIMO radar um, capabilities in all of the, our radar uh, systems. 
which typically you see if we have identical transmit channels, because then if we use the additional modulation capability here and we kind of generate orthogonal transmit channels, then we can go from a basically four receive antenna and three antenna setup to a kind of virtual 12 receive antenna array, which has a um, dependent on your layout, rather large geometry in the aperture. And you can also easily span, for instance, an elevation aperture. And the large aperture typically is necessary to get a good resolution in angle. Um, I told you we are very good in range and velocity resolution. And if you are driving, then also kind of angular resolution, right, is coupled um, to this velocity resolution. But there are some scenarios where we need true angular resolution, for instance, in parking scenarios, because then all of your targets are on this velocity zero line. Um, so you cannot utilize velocity resolution if uh, two targets follow at the same speed, if you have specular multipath reflections and so forth. Typical requirements today, if you uh, want to be attractive, I would say to an automotive customer, you should use or offer like four degree of resolution in Athimus. Um, and for the future, go down maybe to one degree or something like this. So this below one degree is the target goal. But the big challenge in radar, at least compared to uh, communications, is that typically all the signals you have to separate are coherent because they are basically at the same frequency because they are in the same RV bin, but they are just shifted in phase. Um, which is not uh, the case, of course, if you do a uh, direction of variable estimation in communications, where you typically have uh, signals from independent users, right? And we also do have typically just one snapshot available because we just have uh, the snapshot, this radar data cube, and we have to process the cube. So we cannot observe the signals for a long time to get a nice um, direction of arrival resolution. And these are two disadvantaged properties, which basically also limit the use of a lot of, let's say, famous signal processing algorithms to get this uh, spatial um, angular resolution. Of course, the trend is we want to go towards imaging radar, which means to achieve a sub-degree spatial resolution. Um, and now the question is, why is it uh, so hard, basically, to get um, yeah, this high spatial resolution with the radar systems. Now, first of all, the question is, why do we want to go towards this one degree? And I did a very um, simple experiment. I just took a photo with my uh, cell phone camera, um, which has an angular resolution uh, of about uh, 0 0.015 degrees. And then I kind of downsampled that image uh, towards an angular resolution of about 1.4 uh, T7 degrees. And you can see, okay, with this angular resolution, you can do something like an image. And this is basically where this magic one degree comes from. Now, why can we easily um, take an image with a camera? Um, because you have to keep in mind the camera and a radar basically is, is relatively um, um, similar. Well, uh, let's look at the fundamentals. So if we have two point sources, could also be two light sources, so two optical point sources in um, free space, then we have the following. We have here a camera with a certain aperture size. And then what do we see on our sensor screen? Well, on the sensor screen, we see basically the response um, of the individual targets. And basically, we see the Fourier transform of the electromagnetic wave field we have in here and kind of those animations are running um, automatically, which actually I do not want to have. So uh, let's go back. Okay, and we see the individual point responses. So the area disks of those targets. And of course, at the sensor screen, we do not see the individual responses, but we always see the sum, okay? And if they are at the right angular spacing, of course, we can easily make an image because in the sum uh, here, so the Fourier transform of the wave field, we can clearly identify uh, the, the peaks. But now if they are too close together, of course, the, the principle is the same, but in the sum, we just see a single peak. And then even for your optical camera, it does not play any role how many megapixels your sensor has if your aperture is too small. So if your kind of camera or your optical system is limited by this diffraction limit. And this diffraction limit just relates to the aperture size in terms of wavelength. And since at optical uh, wavelengths, our aperture size, even if it's just a couple of millimeters, is rather large in terms of multiples of wavelength, we can make images with a camera, right? Now the radar basically does um, something very similar, but typically we first sample and record the wave field here. And then for instance, if you use a Bartlett beamformer, we apply a lens, a digital lens, because the signal processing algorithm does nothing else than a lens. 
But we are, of course, subject to the same aperture limit. And if you use just maybe on four element uniform linear or antenna array spacing, then it's like just a couple of wavelengths, which tells us, okay, we have a diffraction limit of 28 degrees, which is rather large, okay? So too large to make an image. And, and now basically to uh, get below this diffraction limit, because even for four degrees or 10 degrees, you have to get to below this. Um, typically you have three approaches today. So the first one is that you use super resolution direction of arrival estimation. So utilize some state of the art um, algorithms that you basically get below this diffraction limit by a factor of two to three or something like this, which maybe gives us this four to seven degree. Um, further methods are that you do array inter or extrapolation, which means we can kind of using a post-processing technique, increase the aperture using an extrapolation. And then this kind of drops uh, down the um, angular resolution. This is for instance, one approach which is followed um, by the companies Oculi and also Hella, which has a, let's say a joint approach to that with Oculi. And then um, the other solution would be true large aperture systems. So really use a very large physical aperture or very large MIMO aperture to really push down this physical diffraction limit. So do not go into the way of signal, um, high resolution signal post-processing, but really kind of provide this large aperture using, for instance, um, extremely large MIMO systems like Arbor Robotics or Uner kind of follow. But now let's look at this high resolution post-processing framework. Um, the problem is that um, we have those particular challenges, single snapshot, coherent signals. So only maybe a maximum likelihood search or something very similar, signal processing remain attractive here, but this is computationally very expensive. So typically today, um, the, the state of the art in let's say getting this into the market is that you do um, a direction of arrival estimation, which cannot separate in DOA, but gives you just an initial angle. Then you do a model or the test, basically, if behind this range velocity peak, there are one or two or three targets hidden. And then only if this is necessary, you apply a relatively computational expensive algorithm. Um, the good thing is that this basically allows you to use those methods, but the challenge is, of course, you can just within the, your 50 millisecond cycle, maybe do this maximum likelihood search for five or 10 targets. So you really have to select the important targets here where you apply this. My personal interest is actually machine learning for DOA estimation. And we also had some interesting results and publications on that. So basically put the whole workflow we have here into a feed forward network and then yeah, use this input vector or this data vector here as input to uh, this artificial neural network, which basically was trained on um, performing um, high resolution direction of arrival estimation while simultaneously learning and updating also all the parasitics of your bumper and your antenna array. And basically we show that it's a very um, efficient, let's say approach to high resolution or can be an efficient approach to high resolution DOA estimation, which approaches also the statistical optimum um, behavior. Yeah. Now we had a lot of theory. Um, yeah, typically the data flow from MMIC to vehicle is so we collect the data at the front end, then we do have this radar data cube. We kind of um, do the 2D frequency estimation where we already reduce, of course, um, the range and velocity bins to a certain region of interest. Okay, this is done here. Then you kind of analyze your range velocity and uh, also um, um, now angular radar data cube to create a point cloud here at the detection stage out of your radar data clue, uh, cube, you can further analyze, um, or you typically do analyze this point cloud with a tracking algorithm within your radar system. And then even in the radar system could be at least in a lot of uh, traditional radars, a function, a signal processing block, which is quite often provided to you by your customer, okay? Which um, kind of, um, yeah, analyzes those objects and then could output at the CAN bus the uh, message, um, please bring up the warning light or not, okay? Now in today's radars, we do have a certain flexibility because we can route out data of any of those domains to a centralized controller. And typically today, it's not uncommon that the function is not realized in the radar sensor anymore, but this is realized in a centralized controller. Um, realized by the car manufacturer and that, for instance, you output the tracked objects and like fences 
or on yeah of the uh, regions where you can drive to to a centralized node or even the point cloud okay you could of course route out the um, analog data um here but the limit today is the bottleneck of like all the mode of ethernet yeah, and here's just uh, some examples for you how this looks like. So if you are, for instance, driving on a German rural road, we do have the rear right radar sensor here. Rear left is uh, here. It's interchanged because we're looking to the back of the car. You can see how the 2D FFTs look like. So um, Doppler domain here in the center, zero speed here. Positive speed means targets departing. Negative speeds target approaching. In this example, zero to 24 meters. And um, yeah, we could see basically why we are driving. Um, we have this parabola-like shapes. Those are the road boundaries. Road boundaries very close do create zero Doppler because they do have tangential movement. The farther they are apart, the more uh, Doppler, radial Doppler we get. So we see here our ego velocity basically. And looking at the zero velocity, we can estimate our distance to the road boundary. And then having here uh, those isolated peaks basically is the traffic participants which are following us. The same is true for this rear left sensor, where basically we see, of course, the same ego velocity we are moving at. And I do have some problems here with interesting my slides. And of course, the road boundaries is farther apart. So we can use this knowledge to really place our car on the street. And then we analyze this using the detection algorithm and simultaneously direction of a variable estimation to kind of create the point clouds. You see where the traffic participants are following us. So this is zero to 200 meters to the back. And we also see I have uh, some road boundaries. This is already filtered. So typically you have a lot of more points here. And then the tracker can analyze this and kind of create boxes where we do have um, objects present. And if one of the targets enters one of those boxes, we could have the function emerge uh, the message. Um, yeah, please um, start the warning light in the rear mirror. Now the question is, um, if basically this tracking algorithm um, separates um, the, the moving objects um, from the static ones, so kind of filters this point cloud, the question is, what can we do with the remaining targets? And since basically our radar does have knowledge of the global coordinate system, or at least can track kind of the global coordinate system, because we do have, of course, we do receive driving speed and steering angle from your rate from the car. You can set up a global coordinate system. You can plot all those static targets, so which are not moving with respect to the environment in a global coordinate system. And this is how we can do radar-based mapping, which, for instance, is necessary for um, autonomous valid parking. And just to give you an impression how precise this typically has to be today, one requirement from the car manufacturer, here you can see the responses from the curbstone, is that you can measure the height of the curbstones because, uh, at least in Germany, it is not allowed to park in front of a lowered curbstone. Okay. So this was, let's say, the overview on what we have, um, like what we do for the automotive use. And now let me use the, the remaining couple of minutes um, to basically show you what else we can do with this, let's say, standard architecture which we have, which is today very flexible. And remember, this flexibility comes from this flexibility we need for the automotive application, short range, medium range, long range, all in one sensor. And now what else we can do with this and how maybe this, I think automotive radar could be kind of push factor towards technology for a lot of um, other radio applications in the future. Um, so we were working on a couple of things. Um, of course, we were working on this vehicle interior monitoring and the child presence detection. So basically have a radar mounted here in the rooftop of a car to basically be able to detect which seats are occupied and if we have human subjects on those seats. Of course, there was a commercial interest behind that. And this is those new car assessment programs. So the Europe um, NCAP proposals for 22 and I think 25, where basically it said that if you want to have a five-star security rating as a car manufacturer, of course, you will full should fulfill all of those points from the NCAP programs. And one was the child presence detection. So basically that uh, during the first minutes after the vehicle has been parked, the presence of a sleeping infant can be reliably detected. And then um, seat occupancy detection, which basically means when the vehicle is driving or ready to drive, you can detect the um, occupied seats reliably. Um, you can classify this a bit more because a child presence detection, it 
is basically much simpler because you just have to detect if there is something living. So if there is a child in your car, but you do not have to basically output where the child is, right? So um, this is the child presence detection and seat occupancy detection is very similar, I would say, to child presence detection, but it needs the additional information that you have to kind of output where are the human subjects in the car. And um, we, of course, wanted to do this with, uh, yeah, or utilize the automotive system architecture because we had, of course, the technology in-house. And the big challenge of this is that you, of course, need a very high speed resolution because basically what is the feature? The feature is the breathing of the human subjects you want to detect. And then you want to classify, okay, if this is a human or maybe um, some other things, because, um, for example, we tested with a potted, big potted plant in the car where the leaves are moving. And this, for instance, a potted plant could for the radar very look similar uh, like a human um, subject, like a, 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 an adult human subject. So you need a, um, uh, to get a high uh, fine speed resolution in the order of a couple of millimeters per second. But now the question is, how can you achieve this with this framed kind of um, radar approach? Because you cannot just implement a long coherent observation time. So you kind of have to split your long observation into a couple of radar data cubes. But the problem, of course, is that you lose the phase between those radar data cubes. So you need some sophisticated signal processing to basically yeah, remove this jitter and this sparse sampling with a lot of uncertainties to basically get a very high um, speed resolution because then you can really extract not only azimuth elevation and range, but for each of those bins also, um, for instance, breathing activity in those bins. Yeah, and this basically is what we did. And then of course, um, you wanna implement a classification algorithm. So we did it, this with a lot of, let's say scenarios. Um, we had some baby dolls, which had some motors um, uh, kind of uh, mimicking the breathing. Then of course, human subjects. We had also baby test subjects uh, from our colleagues. Then this very famous potted plant example. And basically this helped to make a big, big database. And you can see how the potted plant looks very similar, like an adult awake. Or what is also very challenging is if you have this sleeping baby or if you just have this crib mobile um, back at, at the car, um, at, the, at the basic seat of the ch car, children. And of course, also like weather, wind, trucks driving nearby is all very challenging. But uh, finally, if you do this at the end, uh, we were able to um, implement just using the automotive radar um, architecture, a very reliable system for those applications. Then a very uh, different application is time frequency analysis. And this basically was some personal interest of mine. Why? Um, because there is a lot of applications where you basically do not want to just do a normal radar for environment monitoring, but you want to basically see what's going on in the air around your car. Um, a couple of, um, yeah, let's say um, um, applications for this is, is of course, we are uh, working hard on this interference scenario, uh, mitigation and avoidance. And of course, therefore you really should be able to analyze the true uh, interference scenarios while you are driving on the streets or uh, at dense uh, like corners or something like this, or crossings, and not only by simulation, but really by, by driving. Then of course, as a car or as a sensor manufacturer, you also want to uh, exactly know how the radars, for instance, of your competitors behave. So which kind of waveforms they use in which driving scenarios, because I told you we are very flexible with the waveforms. So the idea is just drive in front or at the back of one of your of the cars where your competitors' radars are implemented in, and then basically record what's going on. And of course, it's also one fundamental step towards passive and cooperative radar. So if you want to utilize the probe signals transmitted by other radars, of course, you have to know how those look like, okay? Now, if you want to do this, uh, what do you need? Well, typically um, as an engineer's dream, I would say, yeah, take a lot of spectrum analyzers, put them in the car, uh, distribute antennas around the car, um, and then drive and record a big amount of data. But of course, the problem is, yeah, 
just the integration and then of, of course also your management because if you go to your management with this idea i think they won't be too happy with this even if it's a very fancy idea i would say so we came up with the idea um well if you do have a test vehicle which basically has this typical four corner radar set up we can utilize this flexibility which we have in today's automotive radar um, generations to exactly implement this scenario just by software modifications in the radar systems. Because if you look at the block diagram of a spectrum analyzer, and sorry for this automatic switching of the slides, I'm not sure what's happening there. So if you compare this block diagram with basically the receive paths of your FMCW radar front end, so if you switch off the transmitters, then basically you do have a four channel uh, spectrum receiver in your radar system, okay? So we kind of reprogrammed the software of the radars and then we were driving around and yeah, basically it allowed us to monitor what's going on the street. For instance, if you look at radar chirp waveforms um, um, transmitted by a Bosch um, radar, which was in a Volkswagen Golf, you can easily see, okay, th they are using a slow chirp waveform because we do have those couple of ramps, which uh, different ramp slopes, of course, if we kind of, um, change the analysis parameters of our radar, we can really zoom into those waveforms. We can even analyze um, fast chirp waveforms like an active radar, which is used in a Volvo. Of course, here your, let's say, time resolution is a bit limited, but you still can extract the necessary parameters by having some long observation. And of course, as you can see here, it's kind of um, going in real time on the street. So uh, this is basically our car here, and this is the target car. So we are analyzing what's going on there in real time. And yeah, this basically brings us to one of the last applications we were interested in, which is wireless synchronization, because we thought, well, now we can drive along and we can basically analyze which modulation waveforms are used by the other cars. So the ultimate goal would be to, in a passive manner or in a cooperative manner, use the chirp waveforms from another car to kind of derive some information about the situation. But the big challenge is this one, basically. Now, if the blue is, let's say, the target radar, you want to receive signals from, and yeah, this red one is your radar. Of course, um, the problem is that you have to be able to get an extremely precise alignment in time to basically capture the energy of this radar here in your radar data cube, so in your baseband signal. Why? Because remember, we are using extremely large RF bandwidth, like 200 megahertz, let's say for long range applications, but then typically um, like um, one gigahertz up to four gigahertz for future short range applications. And we do have this comparably small IF bandwidth. So typically you always see um, if you have um, signals from another car, this ramp crossing, which means that you just observe the other signal for a short period of time, which gives you a spike in the time domain, which is also the typical, let's say, characteristics of radar interference that due to this spike in your IF signal, the, the energy is distributed in a frequency domain. So interference between radars typically looks like a short increase of the noise floor in your RV image but we want to have this precise uh, alignment to deramp the signal. And uh, yeah, we were really thinking about that. Okay, can we, without any hardware modification to this device, by just um, implementing some signal processing, really do an over the air synchronization so that we basically can collect most of the energy of the other radar, like if this one is transmitting, that we're collecting the energy here. Yeah, and we, we also had a publication um, about that. And basically we, we found out, well, it is possible, yeah, using all this flexibility that you can basically do signal processing and then on the fly reconfigure your um, radar front and your local oscillator, your transmit waveforms, then basically the synchronization is, is possible. It's, it's not so easy uh, to achieve this, but basically um, I think you, you should be able to find this publication if you are interested in the details. We were able to go from this interference-like phenomena. So this is spike in time domain. Remember the rise um, of um, the noise floor and frequency domain due to the interference. And we were basically able to, after a raw synchronization stage, really de-ramp the signal of the other radar um, 
in our baseband. Of course, you see it's not stable, it's moving around and we do have um, uh, still some challenges in here. But what is important is you do now have all the energy collected in your radar data cube of the other radar sensor and you can do further processing uh, like phase noise processing and also keeping this peak more stable um, in a digital manner. So you have the information, you have to post process it, okay? Good. I would say this brings me at the at the end um, for today's presentation. Um, now let's conclude maybe a bit the the presentation and the main points I wanted to kind of deliver to you today. So as a summary, um, we do have a state of the art automotive radar platform, which is a very flexible architecture, and this flexibility basically comes from the fact that yeah we have to reconfigure it on the fly for a future automotive use for future sensing task and the general trend i would say is to more, more flexibility so remember transmit channels typically are going more and more towards true baseband transmit modulators in the future we see that we have a lot of more uh, center frequency options for maybe industrial use or uav use but some ideas like antenna and package and also more and more dedicated hardware processing i think should be considered with care if not the flexibility in is limited there a bit. Um, yeah, like software defined radio, I would say with commercial off the shelf chipsets, with radar today, we do have um, almost um, endless possibilities. And therefore, uh, basically, I showed you those three examples um, vehicle intermonitoring, time frequency analysis, and synchronization. All things which you can do with the uh, commercial off the, off the shelf radar architectures, um, for which basically those sensors were originally not designed for, but just by using some fast software modifications. And I think it really opens this quasi standard architecture for a lot of more interesting apps applications. And I think, um, yeah, we really will be able to implement unforeseen possibilities. And uh, hopefully you have a lot of ideas what could be done with this hardware architecture by using this software defined approach. And I also have basically two key messages. So for one, for those of you who are, um, at the manufacturers of those radar font ends and uh, processing devices. Um, um, hopefully, I could convince you that this flexibility is really very attractive um, in your devices. Of course, for a mass market, you have to lower the price tag and therefore, of course, antenna and package and dedicated processing is of interest. But please do not lose uh, a focus on this flexibility of your devices if you kind of build new generations. And of course, message to the researchers or if you are in companies, working on radar sensors, um, I would say really use those building blocks and, and get creative um, because I think we will see a lot of fancy applications using more more radar for non-automotive use like a civil use also in the future. Okay, thank you, of course, for uh, attending this presentation. And also thanks uh, to my team members um, who did a lot of work on those projects and um, yeah, actually, I hope I was in time um, for today's webinar, and I think we do have some time for questions now. So thanks. Thank you, Markus. It was great, very interesting and comprehensive. I see that we have uh, quite a lot of questions in the chat, so I suggest we will start with them. So I will unmute. I'll try to find the people. Shalom, you are unmuted. Or at least I'm trying to unmute you. And Shalom asks, is it acceptable to have uh, the first few kilometers without the sensor? And will the industry accept that? Yeah. Yeah, actually, this is acceptable. So you have to provide um, basically, of course, on let's say end of line performance. And then you are, of course, this is uh, subject to negotiations. You, of course, um, can in the contract say that uh, some of the functions are um, only working after, after a couple of driving. Oh, so that's acceptable. Oh. I mean, this is a big trade-off uh, because while you are negotiating with um, the car manufacturer, it's not just you provide the data sheet of your radar sensor and then you say, okay, this is the price and this is the performance. But you are then also quite often talking about, okay, how 
is the integration process happening? What is maybe some calibration at the end of the line? And then you as a sensor manufacturer, of course, you say, okay, typically I would, um, I would recommend to have uh, this and this and this calibration, like a, like a, a small um, driving path at the end of the line where, for instance, you can place a Doppler reflectors at some selected um, positions. Okay, so this is a kind of negotiation. And then when the car manufacturer says, okay, we do not want to have this kind of small calibration, do it out of the box, and then you say, well, but then we need um, this kind of auto alignment and auto learn procedure. So it will take a couple of kilometers until everything is fully functional. And this of course is part of the negotiation and this um, also goes into the selection process um, towards you or your competitors. Uh, Ronen, what is the resolution for front facing radar? Okay, I would say, um, so I have to mention that here, so as you also have seen in the talk, um, I was talking a, a lot about those uh, radar cocoon radars and not the, the front radars because um, Innocent and Hella was not doing um, front radars, but I would say they also, so with resolution, you maybe mean the, um, the angular resolution, right? I would say that um, they should typically have like four degrees also around this. Um, for today's and the generations which go into the cars so which are sold and um, working towards um, towards let's say even less resolution because the front radar for ACC typically this one is the high performance radar in those configurations you also quite often see those two MMIC or multi MMIC um, setups yeah. but I would say should be around those four degrees maybe today for some reason we are unable to, un to unmute people, so we will do all the questions through the okay. chat. Uh, Fabian asked about why the MMIC IO is differential, but the antenna is single-ended, and why the balloon is implemented on board. That's actually a good question. Um, so I was more on the signal processing and system side and not on, um, on the chip level side, and also I'm not an expert on, on that one. Um, so Basically, I cannot answer this question. So maybe we, maybe, okay, since other people cannot, cannot actually, but uh, actually I don't know that. So maybe it's more uh, uh, more suitable to get the RF out of the package or something like this. Okay. Uh, Shai ask, how do the systems reject uh, tens of radars in surrounding cars using the same frequencies and uh, transmitter receiver methodology? Okay, so basically, um, radars and so on. Okay, so interference mitigation and handling. Yeah, um, actually, I was uh, not talking about details on this, um, but typically, uh, you utilize a couple of things. So the first one is um, that um, that we typically, if you see interference, you see this spike in the time domain, right? Um, so. The first approach basically is the following. Um, I told you the measurement, a measurement cycle is this 50 milliseconds, but you just measure for maybe like two, three or five milliseconds or something like this. And the remaining time is processing time. So there is a certain probability that the other uh, cars uh, do probe the channel when you are not doing this, okay? Then the second robustness is of course, um, you see typically quite often only this ramp crossing which gives you a spike in the time domain. And then what you do, I mean, you uh, detect the spike because it's short, but um, very large regarding the power. You remove the corrupt samples and then you kind of interpolate over the samples to get rid of this increased noise floor, which creates a lot of ghost targets. So this is the first approach, how you can kind of mitigate the interference, uh, but you also try to avoid the interference, which means even if the radar is not probing the channel, then you utilize like the fact that while your signal processor is kind of with some course processing the radar data, you have some listening before talk cycles. So you basically, you monitor if you see interference and if there is large interference, you try to kind of adjust the timing of your radar sensor. If you are not using the full band, you maybe um, select that you adjust the center frequency for the next measurement. So that's basically approach. So you kind of try to characterize or classify which different radar sensors are around you. You hopefully have or know their measurement principles and strategies and you kind of 
try to adapt that you can avoid the interference. So that's typically how you do it today. Jacob asked about machine learning and can you use the machine learning you showed or machine learning in general to be applied uh, for the time domain data pre the 50? Um, um, it could be, um, could be. Um, of course, the question is then what you want to do with this. Um, but we were focusing really on solving the um, challenge of this spatial resolution, so azimuth and maybe also resolution and elevation. And therefore, um, of course, the idea was to just do it after the 2D FFT. Um, because the question is, why should you do that before? Um, because the, let's say, the um, performance of the radar um, in terms of resolution. Now, if you go back to this resolution limit, diffraction limit, then basically the same limit applies also to range and velocity, because this kind of brings you those, uh, the, the resolution in range and velocity with respect to the waveform. So the principle is very similar. And let's say the diffraction limit in range and velocity, taking into account the RF performance of, of the radar, typically is so good today that the 2D FFT is sufficient uh, as an estimator. So you typically, you do not use super resolution and range of velocity. So you use this very fast 2D FFT, then you are in, in range velocity domain. And then the big challenge, of course, is just this spatial resolution. And therefore, the idea was, of course, to apply it to isolated peaks in range velocity domain. Of course, you could apply it to, to time domain, but then, of course, your data model is a bit different and you really have to think about why do you need it and is it efficient? Okay, we'll do an experiment. Uh, Zib lives net, try to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Zib? Zib, you are supposed to be on mute. Okay. If it doesn't work, I, I will read uh, his question. How was uh, this uh, FOV uh, decided on? Is it taking into account the road uh, curvature standard, for example? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the v, uh, field of view, this is um, typically something which is necess not necessarily related, let's say, um, to our radar manufacturer. We just have to fulfill it, but quite often this is just geometrical considerations um, coming from um, your customers, so from the, um, from the car manufacturers. So what is it decided on? So typically, if you have the field of view for let's say for the focus beam like this uh, 30 degree or so then um kind of uh, you of course have to be able to detect um, all the cars which are behind you and uh, at the um at the lane to your left and to your right especially also if for instance um, other cars are entering the highway this is that scenario and then um for let's say the broad field of view um uh, radars of course you kind of have to be able to uh, provide this full 360 degree radar cocoon. So uh, it was also just rough numbers, um, this 150 degree or those 30 degree. And it's also not, of course, it's not as illustrated, not those hard cut kind of field of views because the question is how do you define field of view on which kind of uh, radar target do you define it? Uh, and then what is kind of the edge of your field of view? What's the maximum detection range here? But typically it's coming from from your customers and then of course you also in negotiations you talk about that in system um, developments what is really necessary there but typically it's from geometrical considerations from from the driving scenarios they have in mind and um, naftali hayat asked about how important is the elevation resolution in automotive radars and what resolution would you demand for this yeah, so when I was talking about DOA um, resolution, then um, today, also those four degrees and so, it was all only a referred to, to the azimuth resolution, right? Elevation resolution is uh, very hard actually to get um, because we do not typically spend large or purchase in the elevation. And then also with the elevation uh, resolution, you do have, let's say, more challenging regarding your uh, your ground, which also is reflective um, to a certain amount. Now, the question here was more on um, how important it is. Um, so 
good. I'm now almost one year out of, let's say, recent uh, discussion, discussions with the car manufacturers. But what I experienced is that so far they were quite okay with not having elevation resolution. So yeah, that you cannot resolve in elevation. Of course, you have to be able to measure in elevation, but resolution, the emphasis on resolution was for, let's say, serious applications, not too important. Yeah, my last stage of information. Huh? Dan is asking, can you comment a few of uh, forward star advertised by some automotive radar developers for improving angular resolution? Uh, this is a good question. Um, forward SAR, actually, I, I, I personally did not come across forward SAR. I came across side looking SAR, um, especially for parking spot uh, detection, um, for instance, but um, actually not for forward SAR. So if you have an interesting idea there, maybe oh. <laughs> it's a good uh, way. <laughs> uh, I, uh... I'm on mute. I can ask a question. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I'm with the Israel Innovation Authority. I'm evaluating uh, programs. I have a long time experience in airborne SAR, mm -hmm. and basically, I do not believe. I think this is just a gimmick, the forward, because at those velocities um, and the short integration time is very, very little to be done. I mean, how much will the aperture actually increase uh, during the motion? So I, I just wanted to, to hear if somebody has uh, some thoughts. Yeah, so I, I cannot, and, and I think also, so, um, the problem with forward-looking SAR is basically, I mean, in SAR you increase the resolution like um, in, in in the direction of movement, right? Um, of now, in forward-looking SAR for highway scenarios, if you are driving behind other cars, you do not have any movement um, in the domain where basically you want to increase the spatial resolution. So I'm not sure if if this is the right approach. What I could think of is of using forward SAR basically to um, characterize your road surface, okay? This could be of interest um, because, um, yeah, there's, a, let's say, a lot of requests from car manufacturers that you want to, in a real-time sense, monitor the road conditions. Also with the radar, for instance, to then input this information into some adaptive suspension. And therefore, of course, you do have movement um, in the direction of where you want to have this resolution because we want to have it on the ground, right? And therefore, maybe it could be of interest, but I'm not sure if it really could improve this resolution, uh, the, the angular resolution um, towards where you are driving, driving to. Huh? Uh, okay, thank you. Another short question. Uh, I'm familiar with Innocent. I didn't know they do anything in uh, 70 gigahertz. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Innocent, <laughs> is, yeah. Innocent is doing um, 24. Eh? At, yeah, it's 24 and uh, the industrial business unit also at 60 gigahertz. And at uh, 77 and 81, basically Innocent is kind of the pre-development center of Hella. But of course, you cannot find this on the website because it's not uh, like those industrial products which you can buy from Innocent. It's just, let's say, a uh, development service Innocent does together with Hella. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now now you, are sh you should be able to unmute yourself. So let's go to the next one. Oh, Shabtai, I guess, not the, the name. Try to unmute yourself. Hi. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, the question is about cascading NLP. What are the limits of the number of NLP that can be cascaded? Okay, so the um, ah, yeah, okay. So the, the audio quality now was not too good, but I see your question here also in this chat. So regarding the scalability, right? Um, cascade. Um, is it four or even eight or higher? Okay, what are the limits? Okay, so typically I have not yet seen, um, so the biggest configurations I have seen was like uh, three MMICs used for uh, implementing this really large aperture. But there's basically um, 
um, a very important limit um, because the limit is not necessarily if you can make it like um, if you can really implement this coherent operation of like three MMICs, but you are running into another problem, which is getting the orthogonality between your transmit channels. Because if you want to do MIMO, um, then today, if you uh, do this using the phase shifters or also you, with the um, time switching or basically it does not matter what you do, but using the MIMO always is a trade-off because if you, for instance, do some kind of phase shifting, it could be a um, cyclic phase shifting or a random phase shifting, then for instance, you, you lose some kind of noise floor performance or you, you lose kind of a velocity performance. And this is kind of the, the challenge. So if you want to use a lot of, uh, let's say, transmit channels, um, how do you, in an efficient manner, really get um, the orthogonal signals? And then, of course, regarding a lot of, um, you could say, OK, if I have a lot of MMICs, then I could also use just a lot of um, receive channels. But then, of course, you're also running into some limit, which is the maximum size of your radar data cube. So if you assume that the total number of elements is limited, if you um, get more in, let's say, the antenna dimension regarding this memory limit, you kind of have to reduce the range of velocity dimension. So this is always the big, big trade-off, um, taking into account everything like modulation waveforms, orthogonality, memory and processing power. So um, this kind of is, yeah, the total limit why I have at least not in a commercial context or with a commercial idea behind I have seen more like two or three MMICs. How do you think that the radar will look like in, uh, let's say, five, ten years from now for the state of the art uh, that you talk with about flexibility and waveform and so on? So um, I, I personally think that um, we will use other waveforms. Um, I actually are um, more, let's say, more convinced on those pseudo-random phase-shifting waveforms compared to OFDM. Um, because, for instance, I could also imagine that we see, especially with pseudo-random phase-shifting, a random, uh, not a random, um, a gradual um, step from traditional FMCW to this pseudo-random um, kind of phase-shifting. Because we already can do things like this today. I mean, we can shift the phase per chirp. And we can do this with a, a, let's say, a couple of bit resolution. So this is also some kind of additional random modulation. And I think we maybe have, will have faster phase shifters so we, that we can also do an interram modulation. And then basically it's just switching your synthesizer to a continuous wave signal and only use this um, kind of random modulation using your transmit path. So I think we will go into this um, direction. And then the question is, uh, yeah, regarding the antenna layout and um, and what we will achieve. I think I'm not sure that we will be able to make the camera not in an efficient sense to be able to make the radar fully complementary to a camera. I mean, a lot of people are talking about the imaging radar, and I think we are going here in the right way to increase the spatial resolution. But if you look just at the physics, then um, imaging radar is not from the physical point of view, what radar is made for, right? Um, so I think there, of course, will be some natural kind of border where it does not make sense to, at least in an efficient way, um, to increase the resolution more. So I would really say that we should not lose, especially velocity resolution, um, uh, out of our minds and just focus it on on this really making the imaging radar. But I think we will see higher resolution. So we will see, I think this one degree will be achieved. and. Um, yeah, then we will see what, what happens now. The next, Rakef. Hey, yes, Rakef. Yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, you related to the fact that the uh, radar has to be uh, used like an out-of-the-box method without the ability to first calibrate it like in lab with like a precise calibration. Can you just uh, shortly elaborate about the general approach for this auto calibration when you don't mm -hmm. know where the calibrator, the corner reflector or something equivalent mm -hmm. is? Okay, so um, of course you can do some uh, calibration at your end of line if you are the sensor manufacturer and this uh, can be yeah, dependent on, of course, the cost calculation, but this can be relatively precise, okay? But what you cannot do is like a precise calibration 
with those mounting tolerances and also like those those um, uncertainties due to the bumper effects there. Um, but typically, what do you do? So um, if you um, convince your customer that it, it um, that there is some short kind of a calibration line where maybe the car is driving through once it leaves the um, the manufacturing line, then of course you know the positions of the corners. But now the question is, how do you do this with the auto calibration? Um, so maybe just to give you one idea, typically this is done for instance for, um, of course, for the direction of arrival estimation to get your basically calibration phases, something like this. And then you can utilize basically that when you are driving on the street and on the highway and you know that steering angle is uh, just like a zero degrees, then you can basically observe your road boundaries, okay? Even without, let's say, a very precise DOA, you see in the images that the road boundaries kind of create point clouds, which are, yeah, parallel basically to your driving direction, but they might have some, let's say, wave-like structure um, due to uh, the, the unknown, let's say, calibration phases. And then basically you can establish hypothesis that you do have those road boundaries, um, which are maybe the mean of those wave-like structures. And then you just have to basically optimize your uh, calibration phases such that uh, the points you receive from the road boundaries basically are more straight on your, on your hypothesis. So this kind of is how, how one of those calibration algorithms, for instance, can work. Okay, and if possible, just one more question. Okay. And another topic, uh, can you just relate to the, between two options of like having better resolution with the super, resolu re super resolution techniques with like small amount of antennas versus like a standard FFT direction of arrival with the large amount of antennas? What would you, what is preferable in your opinion? Yeah, the problem with the super resolution is, okay, so today the problem with the super resolution is um, that we are just uh, limited by computational uh, complexity, so we can just do it for a selected amount of targets. And of course, if you have it with a true aperture, then you have this physical uh, kind of resolution there and you just do it for all the targets. Um, and then also the big difference is that the um, post-processing super resolution DOA estimation happens after target detection. So it is based basically on detection in range velocity domain, and then you process a selected set of targets while true large aperture does this basically before or does, does it in the, in, the, in the analog domain, okay? So this is also a very important um, issue. And then, um, yeah, super resolution. Uh, I think maybe it will also be a combination. Super resolution, modern approaches, which are at least from research papers, quite often like compressive sensing are based on an iterative solution finding. And having those iteration, iterative algorithms also is not maybe the best option um, for, um, for this automotive or uh, safety uh, functional critical applications. So yeah, if you can implement it, Efficiently, then I would say going to the um, yeah true large aperture systems, of course, is of um, more um, more interest. Uh, okay. But but of course, it requires um, it requires the necessary hardware level approach, and the super resolution, of course, is something which you can basically just do um, to a large extent just in the software also. Uh. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Next, Asaf Kasher. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, do you usually use or is analog steering used in uh, to achieve angular resolution? Yeah. Uh, like in elevation domain. Yeah. So, uh, so analog beam steering in the transmit direction, right? Yes. Yeah. No, this is typically not used. Um, and... Um, yeah, this question, uh, interestingly, also comes quite often. And um, um, the, the big problem, I would say, with if you want to do um, analog beam forming is two things. Of course, you need kind of the RF kind of system, subsystems or components, so RF phase shifters on the transmit direction. Um, yeah, 
Losses in power um, already is a problem today. So to make this efficient, this analog beam forming, um, including additional like phase shifters in the transmit passes, of course, is a challenge. This is one problem. And the second problem is they would have to be relatively high resolution to do this adaptively. And uh, the third problem I see is, is especially related to this auto calibration. Um, the problem is um, you are having those mounting tolerances and whatever. Um, you are not sure what are your optimum, let's say, phase shifter settings or maybe also amplitude settings in the transmit direction. And I think this is by far more complicated to find out this and then also implement this um, regarding the receive side, because on the receive side, it's uh, everything is just digital. Okay, so I think it makes it more complicated. Um, and therefore, I'm not sure if it is really attractive. And then, of course, if you are scanning, then you really also distribute your resources, like your number of chirps into different directions, right? So, um, because yeah. right now we are using the whole subset of chirps for the whole field of view, but if you are scanning, then you are distributing this. This is another problem. But of course, there had been a scanning radars um, in, 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 in the previous sensor generations. Uh, yeah, so very... Um, very um, famous one is uh, realization of continental. They had a very, let's say, a fancy setup of a reflecting array, and then they had a rotating, it was kind of a me mechanical, a rotating tube, which kind of scanned the beam on this big surface. And then I had a very narrow uh, beam actually, um, on very good azimuth resolution. And this sensor generation also was used um, or is used in very recent, like, BMW X5 um, cars, for instance, although the approach was very, let's say, uh, yeah, not old, but very traditional, but it had a very good performance. So I think this question uh, is a good question, but for the modern, let's say, multifunctional implementation um, requiring all those um, auto calibration techniques, I think it's just too challenging and maybe um, also, of course, rises the price tag of your solution. Thank you. Michael, Did you have the chance to deal with uh, issues like uh, multipath and uh, side lobes to generate more uh, imaging from, from the radar? No, actually, so this was not what uh, yeah, I was looking in uh, in too much detail. Yeah. Um, we have more than 80 people yet, so please don't unmute yourself. Just wait for your turn. There are still many people that want to ask. Mitch. Okay, thank you very much for the really comprehensive talk. And I have a question. I mean, uh, if you, what you have to do, all the signal processing is done at baseband or at IF. So you have to uh, down convert down to the frequencies where you can actually do, you know, the FFT and anything else you want to do. Now, uh, the down conversion is done by mixing with the RF. The RF that you're going to be mixing with is not the RF that used to be when you, the signal was sent out. It has uh, some small drift and it has some phase noise attached to it. So you're not really um, mixing with the same signal as you should. And uh, especially in a CW radar, wherever, you know, all the information lies in the Doppler shift. And if you're lie, trying to look at, uh, see a kid in the back seat of the car, um, uh, this breathing, uh, you signal is very, you know, the frequency shift is very small. How do you solve this problem? How is it handled? The uh, the breathing detection, especially from from the child. Okay, yeah, um, this is also a question. Uh, uh, let's say. Um, so what is, uh, especially in the near range, so in, um, as you mentioned, uh, we have this phase noise, which is on the oscillator, but we are directly, of course, using the transmit signal um, in, for one input of, um, of our down mixer and also the received signal. Now, since you have the same phase noise on transmit and receive signal, especially um, in this, um, for the near ranges, it kind of um, has the effect that it cancels out to a certain extent, right? Because this is one of the big benefits um, that you have this so-called range correlation effect. Um, for, for very small ranges, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then it kind of gradually comes up. Um, and now the question is how we did it here. Uh, so um, 
the biggest challenge we basically had here was uh, to get basically this big observation time taking into account um, that we do have not a coherent phase between all those chirps we can use because we have to kind of mm. write here in memory, then we have a short break. We start the transmission again. We do not know the length of the break. And then of course, um, all the um, phases are different. Um, actually, unfortunately, I cannot give you more details on how it was done. Uh, so how exactly those, I would say, multiple frames were combined to actually get this resolution. Um, I can just say uh, or tell you basically that, um, of course, this is a large amount of IP here that, yeah, you can kind of get, um, take a couple of frames, take them together, not necessarily fully coherently um, to kind of get, let's say, a sufficient um, characteristic re response of your targets. So uh, yeah, there's also no publications on that basically. Uh. And next is Gonen, Gonen Barkan. Yes, hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I've seen message, you know, um, to the manufacturers and to the researchers, but as, uh, I'm, so I'm leading the radar development in General Motors. So from the OEM side, I was wondering, you know, what would be the, your message to the OEMs? Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, maybe it could be a long list um, from my experience of a lot of like uh, negotiations and um, whatever um, uh, talking about. So what would be my recommendation to the OEMs? Um, if I take it in short, um, I would say that Basically, so my experience was during the couple of years I was involved in the radar market is that um, um, what OEMs did very good um, is to basically build up uh, gradually their own radar competence. I think this is very important because especially a couple of years ago, we had a lot of requests um, which came from or ideas which came from the OEMs not understanding radar um, too much. A uh, very good example was that um, kind of OEMs came up with um, the demand of this extremely high um, resolution, for instance, in angle. And um, for a lot of applications, you just don't need this um, because you have this coupling of speed and angle, for instance. And this, um, for instance, took a long time to really convince them that especially for, let's say, the older um, um, low performance application, um, you actually should not invest like too much effort in true angular resolution because you can basically do it also with um, uh, with this um, speed resolution we have. Okay, so this was kind of process, but I think this is uh, this is much better now because most of the OEM recognize that they should have own radar competence and build this up. Um, yeah, but I, I would say it's really complicated that to, to give a true recommendation to to the OEMs here at this point. Um, um, so, so what what my message will be, uh, at least in this regard, and I really, again, I think this uh, this was a great um, overview of the challenges, and I think um, getting a much earlier and deeper engagement between the community and the OEMs in this level is critical for the success. I mean, we already know you showed some Mario 26, um, and people were asking, what do we need? How, how, how far do, does it need to get? And I, uh, at least from our standpoint, um, again, and, and my domain is exactly this, the, the radar domain for automotive, uh, is that we probably need much more than everybody thinks. Yeah. Um, so bear this in mind. Yeah, I think maybe this also goes into the point I had that really uh, to build up radar competence at, at the OAM side and really to, to be involved in those subjects and um, yeah. Yeah, so, so again, thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome, of course. Next one is Howie. Howie? Howie asks, what is the state of coexistence with other radars? 
the state of coexistence with other radars. So um, uh, I think there's two points maybe which can be mentioned. One, we already had a couple of questions before, which was this uh, interference handling and mitigation. Um, yeah, which basically was uh, kind of is this state, how you how you do it today. So we had this like, listen before talk, classify what the other sensors are, what you see, what they might do, um, detect the, the corrupt peaks and um, uh, mitigate and, uh, the interference. So this is one side. And then of course we have this um, research side where we do have, um, of course, the ideas of novel waveforms. Um, like let's take for example, like sort of random waveforms where of course you study the interference, you think about how different like codes can be distributed or if you do it randomly. But then um, there's also a lot of um, things you have to think about is like um, if you, for instance, what happens now if you go to, let's say, pseudo random radars, um, but you still have a lot of fast chirp radars um, on the streets, then of course you also have to not only check um, the, the interference behavior if you have pseudo random radar versus pseudo random radar, but you have to kind of check all those mutual interference, pseudo random radar, continuous wave, pseudo random radar, FMCW. Um, so there's, I think, um, a lot of things to do. And then, of course, also in research, you have a lot of ideas on how you can yeah, further mitigate interference, um, like using a beam steering or um, beam nulling, for instance, like if you place some zeros um, at the corresponding directions um, where you basically encounter your interference from. Yeah, so those are all points, especially those signal processing ideas can be adapted relatively rapidly into our current or next sensor generations. But I think that's, that's kind of the wrap up on this. Um, on this um, on this issue, I think it's a very large issue. There are a lot of ideas, so you can easily, I think, um, have a separate talk in, on interference avoidance and mitigation and future problems. But um, yeah, hopefully, in this context, I kind of was able to wrap this at least up for you a bit. Okay, next one, Ziv. Ziv Hi, hello, Marcus. I, uh, I just wanted to understand, I know that uh, radar are usually things that are considered the ability to see in all weather conditions and the ability to see uh, in those very uh, harsh, harsh conditions. I was just wondering if you have blockage on the sensor front itself, like uh, dirt or water or anything like that, no. is that something that is also uh, hurting the sensor uh, performance? Yeah. Yeah, very nice question. Um, so maybe we just go back to, um, yeah, maybe to this image. Um, I just went quickly over it and basically explained to you what's going on in this traditional, let's say, radar, um, radar processing chain here. But now if you look at this image, I added actually, um, a lot of boxes here, which I call meta functions in time domain, frequency domain, whatever. Now you have to think about that hundreds of developers typically are working on, on radar generations. Um, and um, also a lot of developers are just working on this software infrastructure here. And a lot of software modules, which are running in those radar sensors are actually um, really focusing exactly that issue you mentioned, which is uh, keeping the sensor in an operational safe state. And one part of this, for instance, is of course, weather conditions, mud and ice. And therefore, um, of course, you cannot, for instance, physically or do much, for instance, if you accumulate ice, for instance, at your bumper, then the ice is there. And I mean, it's just, it limits your RF performance and you cannot look through that, of course, dependent on the amount. What you can do, especially for the front radars, which quite often have dedicated like radomes or so, you can of course implement like radome heating. So to melt the ice away here. So these are, let's say kind of physical countermeasures, but what is more important is especially this operational safe state. And this actually is not too easy to achieve. So one particular challenge is, for instance, if ice accumulates on the sensor, um, for instance, to really to be able to detect um, if the sensor is blind or not, um, which is not 
too easy task. Okay, you can say, well, if uh, if I do not see something, then I'm blind. But of course, there could be the scenario that there is just nothing. Okay, if you're driving in the desert or whatever. So there is a lot of, um, let's say, um, effort put in those um, blocks. So do I see something? Um, how much can I see? Is, for instance, also some customers would like to know not just binary decision, sense of blind, sense of not blind, or um, is the field of view kind of reduced? So maybe is it just the left side which I can detect reliably and not the right side? Or what is now my effective detection range I have? And of course, this also applies to functions like um, if it's raining, um, what is like the rate of rain or what is the rate of spray coming up from other vehicles? Because then, of course, if you have a truck and sprays coming up, this leads to some detections and then you have to kind of uh, be able kind of to verify that. And this, of course, is done in a lot of, let's say, domains like you can analyze the time domain data. Of course, a lot of is happening in frequency domain and on target level domain. Um, yeah. So there is a lot of effort put exactly into those questions. But as you mentioned, there is some challenges like accumulation of ice um, in front of the sensor, which just are physically there and quite often cannot be solved. But you just have to then output the, of course, a reliable information that your sensor is limited in terms of its performance. Moshe okay. Natsuake? Hi, I'd like to ask about uh, some elaboration uh, on the trade-offs between OFDM and the com conventional F uh, FMCW radar, which is a topic you touched in the lecture, but maybe highlight what exactly is OFDM best at and what is worst at compared with FMCW. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe just to highlight this, so let me see if I can go back to this slide. Um, I think, so I typically express it like this. Um, the, the, big, um, the big gain we have in using new waveforms is, and this basically is the only point I typically mention, is an increase in waveform flexibility. Because here we are just sweeping through the bands, but here, and we just have this narrow IF bandwidth, but here, typically, we can kind of really define what's going on in the whole frequency, RF frequency band we are using. And typically, we also use a full band receiver here, at least in this, let's say, top level um, idea of those waveforms, to simultaneously um, can also receive what's going on here. Okay. Now, if you go from this uh, perspective onto those new waveforms, then, um, of course, um, the big increase is um, you need high-speed A to D converters, at least if you want to process the full band digitally, okay, to basically remain the full flexibility. Um, and you not only do you have to collect the data, but you need large memory and also you have to process a lot of more data. Okay, so this could be the top level view on this. Then, of course, we do have a lot of other points. Um, in OFDM, typically you have a relatively high peak to average power ratio, for instance, if you do not, um, let's say, um, do some precise um, or uh, think about how those waveforms should like to kind of um, optimize the peak to average power ratio. Pseudo random radars, which might use just uh, binary phase shifting, for instance, could have this constant PAPR so that you still have this um, efficient amplification and so on. Um, so I would say this is really uh, the big difference that you have to process typically and collect a lot of more data. Of course, there is, especially for pseudo-random radars, a lot of approaches and interesting approaches I have seen which really deal with implementing this standard processing steps in hardware that you also then can kind of process at a, at a reduced data level. And therefore, I have seen more, um, let's say, interesting approaches for the pseudo-random um, phase shifter radars compared to the OFDM radars, okay? So this was, hopefully answers the question. So this was like the top level overview, which I would say generally new waveforms offer more flexibility, but of course, because we can process the full band, 
with the limitations or with the, the big problems we have there is the amount of data rate and data conversion where I see more, let's say, um, possibilities in the pseudo-random radars um, com for efficient hardware implementation. And then, yeah, waveform flexibility. Why do we want to have this waveform flexibility? And this is for me the three um, um, applications is especially the MIMO radar, where we want to have more waveform flexibility to implement simultaneous transmission of orthogonal waveforms, interference mitigation and handling, like um, sort of random radars, we can distribute different codes or whatever, or in OFDM different subcarriers or things like that. And of course, we then have the full band flexibility. We could do something like communications, but I think this is still a bit far away, like the electronic brake light or so. So does this kind of wrap up and answer your question or? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome, thanks. Okay, next one, Sachi. Sachi, we can't hear you. Seems like you are still muted, at least I can. It's not muted, but uh, maybe the microphone doesn't work. Oh, okay. I will read the, his question in the chat. Is it possible to detect speed bumps and their height in order to slow down accordingly? Um, well, um, this relates to, I would say, this kind of... Um, interest of uh, automotive customers towards um, surface road condition monitoring. Typically you don't do this today in, in the radars. Um, we had some studies which were quite promising, but it, it puts some effort on this. And typically you do also not, let's say put too much power onto the ground. I think it could be possible of course, it depends on scenarios, speeds, and whatever it could be possible. Um, but uh, you still do have to invest at least some, of course, development and so on. So it's not just out of running out of the box with some, some minor uh, configuration there. But I think it could be possible, yeah. Okay, thank you. And last one, Amit. Hey, hey, thank you. Uh, hi, Marcus. Thank you for all the answers. A uh, quick question regarding DDMA. MIMO modulations are, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, also uh, similar modulations like the random uh, phase shifter modulation that you mentioned. Uh, first, uh, are you familiar with the with these uh, MIMO modulation techniques? And if yes, uh, do you see any limitations with the amount of virtual channels that these specific uh, modulations can handle? Okay, so once again, did you say TDMI, so time division? No, 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 DDMA, uh, Doppler Division Multiple Access. Okay, Doppler Division Multiple Access. Yeah, well, um, so um, the problem here, of course, is um, always that if you are working, I mean, you, you do have, we do have different domains, let's say, where we can um, achieve this, yeah, multiple access, so the orthogonality um, in, um, in MIMO. Now, if you utilize like this, um, Doppler dimension. So basically you are working with, with the frequencies. Then of course the question is, okay, how do you handle exactly this, um, this um, handle it with the received data? Because if you now look at your uh, regular, let's say um, kind of chirp sequence radar, um, then of course the bandwidth you have available you typically completely use for um, having this un unambiguous Doppler range, right? Um, so it's always a trade-off. Now, if you do MIMO and kind of place the responses from other transmit antennas within this band, then of course the question always is, okay, how do you handle this? Okay, so it's, it's I think always a trade-off. I mean, it's a very interesting solution, but it's always a trade-off because the resource which you typically dedicatedly use was for one sensing task, using one transmit antenna, now suddenly is used kind of for transmit, two transmit antennas, for instance. So you always have to kind of remove the signal somehow in this very simple scenario, so just split your plane in half. Um, yeah, so basically this is uh, what I think can be generally um, kind of um, 
commented on, on, on this one. All right, thank you. Okay. Markus, thank you very much. Uh, you can see from the number of questions that it's not only the number of participants, the number of questions is uh, actually more important to see that such a webinar was very successful. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, it was my pleasure actually to uh, to give this presentation to you and um, yeah, also to answer um, all those interesting questions also gives me the feedback that, um, that um, there is a very, let's say, active, um, interested community here. And um, yeah, hopefully I was able to answer um, all of the questions. Um, so for the audience, of course, there were a couple of ones which um, I was not just uh, deeply into it, but um, yeah, was, was an interesting discussion, I think. Great, thank you. And uh, let's hope that next time we will okay. see you in Israel. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so thank you and um, yeah, goodbye. Bye bye.